Now, I know we have probably several mathematicians here today, so we might draw on their wisdom a little bit with this, but what do we see here? Triangle, right? Yeah, a right triangle, because you even have that little um, space here that's indicating 90, 90 degree angle. But um, if you were at point A and you wanted to get to point C, what would be the quickest way you could get there? Straight line. Yeah, you would go this direction, right? Now, I think some Greek mathematician came up with that formulation. Um, Ken or somebody, you might know who his name is. I, I'm not sure. But the, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? Now, I'm sure Ken and Sarah and Kathy and others could talk about the Pythagorean theorem and the, 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 how we measure the lines, and, and that would be awesome. Um, but for our purposes today, I want you to keep this object in mind. The shortest distance to get from this point to this point is by going directly there. So if you think of this as, as, as people in a conversation, person A, the quickest way for them to interact with person C would be to go to them directly. It would not be to go to person B and then ask person B to carry the message to person C. It would be to go directly to person C, all right? So we need to keep that in the back of our minds today. This is going to be our visual. We're going to refer to it several times. I want to encourage you to take out uh, your pew Bible or your own Bible if you brought it um, and turn to Matthew 18. The pew Bible, we're going to be on page 952. And I want us to ask the question, um, what comes before our passage today and what comes after it? Because if we can see the broader context of the chapter, it's going to help us understand the heart or the spirit in which the passage comes to us today, what its intent is. So if you were to look in your pew Bible, if we just go by the headings that are in our pew Bible, for example, if you're looking at verse uh, 10, verses 10 through 14, what is that called in your pew Bible? Lost sheep, right? The parable of the lost sheep. And then, you know, what is that parable about? Just briefly. What, what, when you look at it, just what in, in initially emerges? It's a parable about God's heart and compassion. Sorry, I'm standing in the way. It's, it's a parable about God's heart and compassion for the lost person, right? So even though he has a flock of, of 99, um, he'll go out and he'll seek the one that is lost. So the passage is, wants us to understand that God is a compassionate God. That's the example. When we look to him, that's how his heart works. So before we even get to our passage today, we need to remember in the back of our mind, what is God's heart for people? It's restorative. It's redemptive. He goes out and finds the lost one, right? And brings them back, and they're joined with the flock. Okay, now, before we talk about our passage, what comes after our passage? So that would be verses 21 through 35. What is that called in our pew Bible? Yes, it's a parable of the unmerciful servant. The unmerciful servant. So I'm going to write that here. And what's that, what's that passage about? If you were going to boil it down to its simplest. It's about, yeah, Janine said it's about forgiving, forgiving 70 times 7. Um, and what is the unmerciful servant like? He's like the person that won't forgive, right? So the past, that parable is really about forgiveness. The call to to, to never stop trying to forgive because that reflects God's heart. So already before we jump into our passage that talks about today, talks about when someone sins against us or we might write it up here as conflict in the church, um, which would be, yeah, verses 15 through 20, where we are today. Before we even get to that, we have a broader context of a compassionate God who seeks the person who's lost and of a God who values forgiveness. So that's going to frame this whole discussion of the triangle and how we communicate and work through conflict. Because at the heart of it, at the heart of the triangle, at the heart of this process that Jesus gives us today about how to deal with conflict is a heart to restore relationship and to bring forgiveness. Okay? You tracking with me? So what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to just ask you real quick 
now that we've seen where our, our passage today fits into the bigger chapter, um, what are the four steps that Jesus invites us to in the passage? He gives us four steps when a conflict arises in the church. What is the fourfold process we walk through? What's the first step? Go to the person directly, right? So person A, if, if they sense that person C has hurt them or they feel that um, they've been sinned against, there's some conflict emerging, person A, Jesus says, should go directly to person C, right? Pretty, pretty direct here in our passage. What if that doesn't work? What does Jesus say? Get another believer. So Jesus says person A can go to person B, who's another believer in the church. Um, and the, the two of them then together can approach person C. It doesn't say person A should go to person B and do pass-through feedback to person C. But the two of them together should go to person C. All right? What if that doesn't work? The church, so a broader collection of people, you know, the church body, person A should go to the church body, and they together as a community will approach person C. Person A is involved in that conversation. And then, what if they don't even listen to the church? What happens then? There's a break in fellowship, isn't there? There's a, there's, a, there's a separation to treat them, to interact with them differently, as though they were a, a tax collector. Maybe I shouldn't say break in fellowship, but what I should pro- probably say instead is there's a different dynamic in the way that they interact. They, they treat them as, in, as a tax collector. So we're going to walk through these four steps and think about them together. They seem uh, pretty straightforward, and um, they seem pretty practical. Well... The author of the book that we've been going through, Reconcile, his name's John Paul Lederach. He came up with his own version of Matthew chapter 18. Um, you know, we read the NIV this morning, and he calls his version, let's see here, what does he say? The normal practical version, or the normal practice version. So listen, this is his version of the Matthew 18. When you have a problem with somebody in the church, check it out first to make sure you are not alone in this problem. There is a good chance that if you have, a, have had a problem with this person, so if you're person A, you've had a problem with this person, somebody else as well, like person B, will have had this problem. And they're likely to understand and agree with you. And if they agree with you that person C is a real turkey, then talk to some more people <laughs> to see if there's a broader consensus. And if money, land, or inheritance is involved, tell it to a lawyer as the lawyers um, were given by God to keep the church honest. And if a friend, a small group, and a lawyer agree, then tell it to the church, preferably in private to the pastor and the elders. When you tell them, say it is a concern that you have prayed about for some time and that there is a group of people who share the concern. Do not tell it openly in a congregational meeting since that is volatile and could get messy. Truly, I, I say to you, from this point on, It is the responsibility of the pastor and the elders to take care of the problem. Your task is to make sure that they do it right. (laughs) Now, obviously, John Paul Lederach is giving us a terrible (laughs) uh, translation of Matthew chapter 18, and he does that on purpose um, in in a humorous way, but also to challenge our thinking about how we put into practice the call in our passage today to begin by going directly to our brother or sister. So I feel like it's very important that we, this is the type of thing I can't just speak with you about and you you hear me, but it's something that you actually, I think, can process together because you have a lot of insights about this. And so what I would like to ask you to do is to form small little groups briefly here for about five minutes, just around where you're sitting, if you could pull in maybe four or five people in the group, if possible. And I want you to ask this question. I'm going to erase this here. I'm going to draw a little picture. 
So if we think of the circle here as conflict, this is conflict. What here is at, at the center or at the heart? What is at the center of conflict in the church? Just sit around your group and say, what's normally at the center, at the heart of conflict when it's present in the church? That's the first question I want you to ask. That's question one about that. Like why or what, what is at the center? And question two is about Jesus' advice. All right? And I want you to ask the question, if Jesus' advice is so practical and straightforward, why is it seldom practiced? If his advice is so straightforward and we can clearly, we understood it very quickly and we put it on, charted it, why is it so seldomly followed or practiced? So please take five minutes to form groups and to process this together. As you shared, from the perspective, if we were to take the number of things you shared and, and put ourselves in the shoes of person A, as we look at that path to person C, it seems to me like what you were saying is person A would see all kinds of barriers and risks to approaching person C. As they look at that path, it's not a clear path, and, and they're intimidated as they look at that path. And maybe in their own mind, they build up a lot of um, assumptions uh, about person C and how they'll respond, and that adds to the barriers. Maybe their hurt level is very high, and so the idea of being vulnerable and approaching person C is scary. And really, and this is, this is tough. So I, I do not, that was very appropriate what Paul Sealing said. It's not easy to take that trip, that journey to person C. Uh, but there's something really important about taking this trip. What does uh, Jesus tell us in our passage today at the end? You know, we were uh, looking at the beginning of our passage here, but as we get towards the end, towards verse 20, what does he say? Verse 20 specifically. Can you, um, can you, can somebody say it out loud? Yes. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with you. So we have the promise. Okay, now this is interesting because we often think of that passage in terms of corporate worship, don't we? When two or three of us gather, whether we're a small group doing Bible study or praying together or a corporate group singing, God is there in a special way as the gathered community, right? We don't always think of this promise in terms of working through conflict, but that is the context for it in our passage. It comes right after the call to go directly to our brother or sister, and God promises us if we are faithful to walk in this journey, that he's going to be there. He's going to be with us in a special way. He's going to be at work in that interaction, and the outcome is not just going to be what's possible from our human thinking, but it's going to be what's possible in light of what he can do. So in our book, Reconciled, by John Paul Lederach, he says, we have to do a lot of reflection before we approach person C. We, we have to work through a lot of our own fears and we have to come before the Lord in our vulnerability and ask for him to help. Help us understand why we're feeling what we're feeling, what's behind it. Maybe help, help us see if we have misunderstandings. And do a lot of work with the Lord directly to help us remove these barriers even before we approach person C. But as we've done that work with him, even though it's hard, then we have to step out in faith and ask for his help to go directly to person C, trusting that he's with us. Now, what if it doesn't work? Already, we have the pattern. We've already done the prayerful discernment. We've sought the Lord. We've met with them. It hasn't made a difference. In the spirit of the passage, we prayerfully again go to another brother or sister that we really feel will be mature in the Lord and honoring this process, this holy process that we're given. And we follow what Jesus says, praying with them for the same thing, that the Lord would remove the impediments to working through the conflict. What if that doesn't work? Then we as a church body 
are able as a Christian community to come around and try to pray corporately for the conflict and to give support to all parties involved, person A, person C. And if that doesn't work, we might think the passage then says, well, we reject the person, person C. But I want to remind us of something, and this is very important. What is surrounding our passage today? The call for redemptive outreach, right? The parable of the lost sheep. So when there's that one person that's not in with the 99, for whatever reason, they're apart from them, God never wants to give up on them. So even if the church has to say, we don't, we can't support your behavior right now, if it, whatever it may be for person C, we don't support that. But we continue to pray for you and we continue to seek to have interaction with you, engagement. But we will, as a community, call out speaking the truth in love that we can't support the behavior, whatever it may be. But we never stop the redemptive journey. The reason why the passage says to treat them as a tax collector, how did Jesus treat tax collectors, folks? How did he treat them? He ate with them, right? He continued to have relationship and interaction with them. He continued to tell them about the ways of the kingdom. And so by treating them as a tax collector, it's that kind of, once again, calling them back to the reconversion of heart. It's not giving up on them and cutting them loose and saying good riddance and sending them off. And how many times is forgiveness going to be used in this journey, potentially, if we look at the end of our passage and what comes after it? 70 times 7? That's a lot of times. And it really doesn't just mean that number. It means an endless amount of times. We're called to forgiveness. So I, wanna, I want to leave you today with a calling. You know, this is a challenging passage, and, and I hope it's stimulating all of our thinking in our, in our own lives and as it speaks to our own situations. But I want to call you today to be committed to Jesus' words here. You know, we said at the beginning of the series, we're on, we want to be, as we want to be missional as a church, we want to be reconcilers. And so this whole season of Lent, we're on this journey. What does it mean to be a reconciler? This is a big part of what it means to be a reconciler, to really understand this pattern that Jesus has given us here, this helpful pattern that involves the self-reflection, that involves the journey with the understanding that, G, that God is going to be present when the two or more are gathered. It involves the care of the community. And I want to give you this charge today to be an advocate. Will you be an advocate for healthy communication in our congregation? Will you, be, will you commit to this model of doing relationship and doing communication? Will you be an advocate for the practices that build community and build trust and model the way of Christ, not those practices that divide and sow mistrust and division. I call you today as you leave, let that rest in your mind and, and please answer this call to be an advocate and know that Jesus is at work in this calling and it's part of what it means to be a peacemaker. And the calling doesn't just stop in the walls of our church. These principles can be value, valuable in many places in our world and in our lives. These principles can be transformative in other, in other contexts too outside the church. So I call you to be an advocate for the way of peace, the way of Christ. And ask for God's help when we do sense the barriers and when it seems impossible. Ask for his help to have the courage and the grace to live in this way. Will you bow your heads with me, please?